What's going on everyone? This is SuperTal3 and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we are going to be reviewing the EC Council Certified Ethical Hacker. Gonna review it, gonna tell you like some of the main areas, give you a brief overview of kind of what the exam structure is like, as well as tell you my opinion on whether or not you should take this exam in 2020. I've already taken it, but should you use your time and your money on this exam? Stay tuned. All right, so to start off, this exam is 125 questions long. And yes, I am talking about the ANSI version, ANSI. I forget what the acronym actually means, but basically it means it's the multiple choice version of this exam because there is a practical version if you decide to take that. That's supposed to be more advanced than the other one, uh, than the multiple choice question, which multiple choice question isn't that hard. So I'm hoping that anything practical would be. And it would probably be better for you to take that, but you're supposed to, according to the path on their website, start with the multiple choice question, then the practical, then there's like a few others to go on a path of like a master hacker or something crazy. Anyways, this exam is pretty much divided into five main areas that you're gonna wanna focus on on your studies. And these are the five phases of any hacking operation. The first one is reconnaissance, or also known as recon. And this can be divided into two main things, passive recon and active recon. Passive recon will typically come first. This is when you're browsing social media to find employees, emails, phone numbers, social media profiles, anything that they could have leaked. If you're, if physical penetration testing into a building is in the scope of this penetration test, then you're going to want to try and find badges so that way you can kind of clone a badge or anything like that. Like you couldn't actually clone permissions or anything, but you could clone like a picture and you know, you know how their badge looked so you could get in. Active reconnaissance, however, is something like running an in-map scan on their public IP space. So there's websites that you can go out to find companies at public IP ranges. You can use in-map or mass scan to scan those IP addresses, run port scans against them, and try and determine if there's any easy low-hanging vulnerabilities on their external facing IPs. You could also go and look at their website, run like GoBuster or Durbuster on there, try and see if there's any hidden directories, find out if a web application firewall is on it, if that's the way you could get into the environment, different things like that. The second phase of the ethical hacking process is gaining access. So this is where you're gonna take all the information that you gathered in your recon phase and actually translate that over into action by using that information to find a vulnerability and get gain your initial foothold into the corporate environment whether that's you find a SQL injection so you're able to dump a database on the website that happens to have a password in it, use that password to remote access the database. I mean, there's all sorts of things. Basically, the goal here is to achieve remote code execution on a machine in the company's network. Remote code execution is basically where you somehow get a program to run that's typically a reverse shell that will connect back to your machine and allow you to execute whatever commands you want to on that host. This leads us to the third phase of an ethical hacking engagement, which is enumeration. Here, you want to, once you've gained your initial foothold, so completed areas one and two, reconnaissance, gaining access, take your initial foothold and use that to scan and figure out kind of what the, get the lay of the land, so to speak, figure out what their environment's like, because different corporations can have a whole lot of different environments. So a lot of this is gonna be scanning, et cetera, using InMap most of the time. InMap's the most popular network scanner out there. There are a lot of questions about it on the test, not a ton. I can't give any exact numbers, but I wouldn't say it's above 20 or 30 questions for sure. Um, there's a lot of little like MAP flags and things that if you've used NAP for any length of time, you'll have no problem passing that part of the exam. You'll use NMAP to scan their network. And then after that, once you've kind of figured out the lay of the land, you'll start using a lateral movement to maintain access, which is the fourth phase of an ethical hacking engagement and that is maintaining your access so you want to make more than one way to access the organization in case they find one way that you have that way you have a few backup ways so that you can still get back in and maintain what's called persistence within their network now obviously if it's a penetration test and you're just reporting vulnerabilities you're not going to want to stay in their network all the time like you would if you're a malicious hacker but nonetheless this is a important phase of the ethical hacking or hacking in general process Finally, the last phase is covering your tracks. So as an actual hacker, black hat, um, white hat would probably do this too, especially if you're in a red team engagement. As a hacker, you're going to want to cover your tracks, step number five. You can do this through deleting logs as logs are records of anything that happens. So if it's only on local machine logs, you can just go and like delete whichever logs if you do anything malicious so nobody knows. 
Now, if they have a security information and event management tool like Splunk, for example, or maybe even Security Onion, it gets a little harder. And I mean, I'm not personally experienced with having to do any of that. Um, I've never actually done any penetration testing engagements, though I want to do that in the future as my career. But anyway, I haven't done that, so I can't give you any experience on like how you would avoid that or anything. And I have a feeling it's probably impossible to avoid having worked with Splunk a lot pretty much gets sent logs constantly. So unless you can compromise Splunk and like delete all the logs off of that, then you're pretty much screwed on that point. But anyways, that is still an important thing to consider. Not a lot of companies have that kind of really good security program. And even if they do have the logs, it might go unnoticed if they don't have a good way to monitor it set up. Also, you'll want to encrypt any communications you do have. So that way no one can see it running packet captures or anything. They'll see encrypted information, but they won't actually see what you're trying to do. Um, a lot of times also they'll use this to hide it in what are called covert channels, which is not like the main way you would normally communicate. like. For example, HTTPS is typically over port 443, but if you're a hacker and you're trying to hide your communication, you, you might want to do HTTPS over DNS, which would be on port 53, which is where people might not necessarily look. Therefore, that will allow you to e more easily hide your communication from the blue team. So that's pretty much all of the kind of content on the exam, the five main areas. They are going to be on the exam for sure. So kind of organize your studying by that. I'm not saying that there's gonna be like 20 questions in part one, 20 in part two. I, they're really not that way, but those are the five main phases. And so that's definitely what you're going to want to look out for. And that's a good way to organize your studying, especially if you're doing a book or anything like that. It's probably going to be organized that way. A few random things I did notice. I found one attack that was really interesting and that was called the rubber hose attack. Rubber hose attack apparently is where if say somebody had a password to an encrypted drive and you needed that drive, if you are a bad hacker, so black hat, you would somehow kidnap that person and beat them until they told you the password. Basically torture. And that is not ethical at all, so I don't know why I was in the study materials, but just know what that is, a term, rubber hose attack, even though you should never, ever, ever, ever use it as a white hat hacker. It's completely unethical, and so I don't know why it's on there, but it is. thought that was a little bit of interesting thing that I learned during this test. I personally used the Kaplan study questions to study for this test. I prefer using study questions for multiple choice exams, not because they were the questions on the exam, because they weren't. Um, Kaplan is a reputable brand who does study questions, but because I'm able to take a question and do it, and if I get it wrong, they have really good detailed explanations, and then I'm able to go Google further from that and actually actively engage my mind and learn it because I want to figure out what the answer is rather than just reading it in a dry textbook. Seems to work better for me that way. Other times I like to watch videos, although I didn't for this exam, I pretty much just use the questions and then Googling to learn everything. But I do highly recommend videos if you can find a good course. There's probably some on Udemy. I know LinkedIn Learning has one. I believe it might be even the official one, but that's for like version nine or eight. So it's a little bit outdated. And also I heard their latest video course isn't all that great anyways. So yeah, take what you can get as far as study materials. There's probably some good all-in-one books. I did hear there was a pretty decent one, um, but I like Kaplan's practice questions. I felt they were very accurate as to the difficulty of the exam, and those are my primary study material. Now, on to do I think that you should take this exam in 2020? Honestly, probably not, but maybe. And the only reason that I would take this exam is one, if you need it for the DOD certification level, um, there's different certifications that'll get you in different levels of the DOD as far as if you're out working on base or contract or whatever, and you need access to a certain clearance level, you need to have a certain certification. It's above the security plus, but I think the CYC plus is on the same level. So if it is, then you could just get that. And I think that's a more valuable cert. However, um, there's the advantage in that. And the only other reason that I would take it, and this would probably be bundled with the first, is if your company requires you to take it, and it would probably be for that reason, or maybe they just want you to take it and they're gonna pay for it because this is a very expensive exam. It can range anywhere from 800 to $1,100 once all is said and done, and that's not including EC Council's official training. I was reading that it is about $800 to take the online test. You have to pay $100 beforehand to be considered eligible. Then if you wanna take it at a Pearson View Testing Center, it's about $1,000, and then there are training is somewhere between $700 and $1,000 for the official training for this exam. So it's very, very, very expensive. And I'm not sure that I 
would recommend it for the price considering the content of this exam. I took it through WGU, which is my college, so I didn't have to pay this ridiculous amount, but I still would highly encourage you to consider some other options besides this exam. If your employer isn't paying for it and you don't need it for the DOD clearance, because as far as the quality of the questions and stuff, they're really not once you take this exam, this is not going to make you an actual hacker. You have to learn that stuff on your own. Own. There are some better certifications that are more hands-on and practical that will have courses that will actually teach you how to do everything, which I will talk about in just a second. So anyways, onto those other courses. There are two other major security certification vendors that I've seen a lot of, and they are Offensive Security and eLearn Security. Offensive security has been around a while and their primary certification that a lot of people look for in penetration testers is the OSCP. It is a very fun certification I've heard to take. It's a 24 hour long test. It's an actual engagement. So you're actually having to go in and hack the machines, write up a report after it and submit to get your OSCP certification. It's widely recognized by HR. So you won't have a problem there either. And the course that comes with it teaches you how to do all of the pen testing stuff that you would have to do for, to get that exam and also a lot of the stuff that you would need for the real world. The other one, eLearn Security has three big penetration testing certs, the EJPT, which is Junior Penetration Tester, the ECPTP, I believe, that is the Penetration Testing Professional, and the Certified Penetration Testing Expert. Now these are in three tiers. I would say that if you wanted to line them up with the Offensive Security Certified Professional, I would say you would do the EJPT, OSCP, then the ECPTP and the, the ECPTX exam. So there's, they're really like kind of, you could all do them in like a big order like that. Or you could go with eLearn security or just offensive security. Offensive security is going to have a lot more HR cred, but I've heard that the eLearn security exams are even better. They're a lot more thorough in real world, especially once you get to the PTP and the PTX courses and exams they all come with courses to teach you how to do pretty much everything that we need to do to pass the exam so they're a lot more detailed and i i think that they're a whole lot better option than the certified ethical hacker quick disclaimer i haven't taken those yet but i do plan to in the near future so when i do i'll definitely be making some videos all about that so this review is pretty much done i just want to give you guys a quick update as to what my plans are for the future so that way you guys are kind of in the know because I know that I haven't made any videos since late May. It's been a while, but I'm almost 250 subscribers. So thank you guys so much for that. I'm really excited that I'm almost at that sort of milestone and I'm hoping to reach a thousand by the end of the year. So if you guys are new, please consider liking the video and hitting the subscribe button if you liked this video. If you didn't like it, hitting that down thumb button twice also works as well to really show your dislike. And comment below if you have any questions or any recommendations for future cybersecurity, Linux, or tech related videos. So I, I was just really busy this summer and I didn't really have a whole lot of time to make videos. That's why I kind of left unannounced. I had some stuff I was working on with college, but I am done with college now. So I'm able to completely focus on my career certifications and making videos for you guys, which I plan to do a whole lot more of in the future. I'll make sure to announce if I ever go on any long breaks like that. Right now, my plan is to start making at least one video a week, and then I'll scale it up to two videos a week in the next two to three weeks, just to give me some time to get back in the groove, improve my process for making videos and editing, etc. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. This is SuperTal3 signing out.